Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. If you like these videos, do me a favor and subscribe right here to watch box reviews on YouTube. I'd really appreciate it and I'd be able to send watches like this, sometimes two at a time, straight to your inbox as soon as tomorrow morning. If you like these watches, you can buy one or both on the watchbox.com. Buy, trade, or sell luxury watches 24 hours a day and globally on thewatchbox.com. Today, we have another one of my kind of pocket versus comparisons. This isn't the full post-production job that you're used to seeing on Sunday morning. This is just me with two similar watches and a comparison and a contrast for your viewing pleasure. On the left, the 2010 F.P. Journ Vagabondage 2, limited edition of 69 pieces in platinum. That watch preceding the watch on the right by only a few months, as this was the 2009 model year, Alango und Zona Zeitwerk in white gold. Let's talk about the feel, the fit, and then let's compare and contrast. Because the Jorn was second to the party and the Langa came first by one model year. We're going to go with the Langa first. Now you can see on my wrist, my wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference. We're going to do our best to get the watch in focus, zoom out a little bit, let's do a wrist shot here. And my wrist is 16 centimeters circumference, the watch is 42 millimeters in diameter. It's actually about 42.2. In terms of thickness, and maybe not as thick as you expected, 13 millimeters with a generously sloped domed bezel, it should slide underneath most cuffs. The timepiece is fairly broad from lug to lug, but again, it's not quite the giant it appears at first glance. 49.9 millimeters across the wrist, it is very hefty, as the case and lugs are substantial, but you'll note that the lugs are nicely downturned. They're rather short, stubby, and pivot dramatically down and around the side of the wrist. You can also see that there's no constraint in the movement of the strap, which you can pull straight down around the tight curve of a small wrist. The strap is lightly bolstered down the center, large rectangular scale alligator leather, semi-gloss finish, monotone stitch in a folded edge, it's calfskin on the underside, and you see Langa's characteristic pin buckle with the retaining bar, so if you do tend to buckle your watches down to the smallest hole, and those of us with small wrists know that can often result in a little bit of a pinch, and sometimes the strap becomes pinned on the pin, such that you can't extricate it. This retaining bar prevents the strap from getting stuck on your wrist when it's strapped down tight. The case is relatively simple, but it does not lack for character. There's a horizontal case band defined by the junction of the case back, the mid case, and the bezel, with contrasting satin and polished finish. You'll also note that the lugs themselves are dramatically stepped out from the case blank. There's a small cleft between them, so that they have their own sculptural form, and they do stand out as separate components rather than a blended aspect of the case. They're strong in their own way, polished on the tops, polished on the flanks, with a narrow and almost invisible bevel that transitions from the tops to the flanks. The bezel is all of high polish and domed. The dial features Langa's signature time bridge. What you're looking at here is actually part of the movement that has been rhodium coated to contrast perfectly with the matte black of the dial base. Now what you see here is actually a clear sapphire that marks the pivot for the concentric minute and tens of minute discs. So this is part of the movement itself. There's a classical counterweighted white gold seconds hand at six o'clock tracing its own small sector dial with outboard railroad. You can see the minute will start to preload just before the jump, and then it will jump precisely, jumping minutes, tens of minutes, and hours. There's a sunken track at 12 o'clock for the power reserve scale, 36 hour power reserve, and an oversized crown that is an absolute pleasure to wind. It feels good, it sounds good, and between the two of them, this is the more pleasurable of the two watches to wind. Now turn the watch over and you can see the caliber and it is a mighty machine. Let's get as close as we can here and perhaps even allow ourselves a bit more aperture in this light. But this is Longa Manufacture Caliber L043.1. You can see it is beautifully executed and the movement features a striking array of mechanized mayhem perfectly balanced so that 18,000 vibration per hour of the balance occurs unimpeded even though a huge amount of energy is pulsing through the movement each time the minute jumps. So you follow the power from the crown through the crown wheels reduction and then ultimately to the barrel where there's a stop works that stops the movement from operating when there's insufficient power to jump the minutes. You'll also note that 
The barrel is huge and appears to be anchored heavily to the bridges. That's because one side of the spring is actually anchored to the movement and the other side is anchored to the arbor of the barrel. That's how much energy and that's how strong that mainspring is. You'll also note there's a sort of time bridge in its own right on the case back. This system is the Raymontoir. There is an air brake that acts sort of like a pinwheel to slow down the power as it comes through. The energy slows down. There's a separate locking pallet. You can see it's two stones that allows the quantized bursts of energy to proceed through a double third wheel assembly. And in between the two third wheels, there's actually a hairspring that acts as the Raymontoir. It's a hairspring rather than the linear spring often used by Jorn. It meters a quantized burst, always the same amount of energy, to the free sprung balance once per minute. And you'll see the system springs into action and then jumps that small amount of power via the unlocking of the pallet that you see just beneath my finger. Ultimately, you do have stop seconds on this watch or hacking seconds, a feature not included on the Journe, but that's an important refinement if you like to set your watches precisely. 415 pieces adjusted in five positions, 68 jewels and an overcoil hairspring, so the watch has superb resistance to positional or gravitationally induced timing deviation. The Journe has a flat hairspring. All of the bridges in nickel, copper, zinc, also known as German silver, an unplated material that gives it that rich golden hue. You'll also note both black polished screws and heat blued or kiln fired screws visible on this movement. Glossuta stripes across the edges of the bridge. You'll also see that the three quarter style bridge pays homage to the heyday of German pocket watches and freehand engraving for the escape wheel cock as well as the balance cock. No two of these components are exactly alike because they're not done with a lathe or an engine, they're done with a chisel. Finally, though you can't quite see it, and it's more apparent when I turn the watch flush to the camera, there is mirrored englage or rounded profiling to the edge of every bridge and plate. You can even see it in the jewel and screw countersinks. Absolutely sensational. This watch remains a phenomenon almost a decade after its debut. One year after the Zeitwerk, we saw the second of the F.P. Journe Vagabondage series. The original was a jump hour. This one is a jump hour and minute. And as you can see, we're going to throw it on the wrist. It is a far more compact timepiece than the Zeitwerk. Right here, this watch is one of 69 pieces made in platinum for the 2000 model year. There were 68 made in rose gold for 137 total. It's 37.5 millimeters across the case from what would conventionally be nine to three. And then it's only eight millimeters thick, so a full five millimeters thinner than the Zeitwerk. Lug to lug, it's a tidy package. 45.3 millimeters. It does feature a quirky strap spacing, whereas the Zeitwerk is a rather conventional 20 millimeter strap spacing. This one is 18.5. So you're going to use an OEM strap or you're going to have one custom made. The watch is hefty, being all in platinum, but a substantial portion of that comes from the full deployment clasp in matching platinum. This is an upscale measure that I consider an advantage over the, the Zeitwerk. Two heavy and expensive watches, you really want that full loop around your wrist that you get from a deployant rather than the risks that come with a pin buckle. Longest pin buckle is smarter than most, but this is how it should be done on a watch of this price. You can see that the watch is so compact that it could easily wear on a wrist as small as 13 centimeters in circumference, whereas about 14 and a half centimeters circumference would be the lower limit for the longa. Of course, the timepiece jumping hours and minutes. And the reason I chose the Vagabondage 2 rather than the 3 was because the 3, although in some respects similar to the longa in that it does feature a remontoire, the 2 with its jumping hour, jumping minute, and power reserve scale on the dial just feels more like the Zeitwerk. And they were so close in terms of release date that I felt they were more naturally comparable. Now you will note there is no mention of the manufacturer on the dial of the Vagabondage 2. The only place you're going to see FP Journe is on the case back, on the movement as well as the case back surround. This was a tradition that began with the first Vagabondage and continued into the third series watch that was delivered in 2017. There's nothing on the front of the watch to betray the maker. You will note a few quirky features of the dial side of the watch, starting with the smoked sapphire, which gives you visual access to the dial side of the movement as well as the discs that operate the jumping mechanism. 
the bridge and bezel that forms the frame is not actually symmetrical. In fact, it is highly asymmetrical. From side to side, almost nothing lines up except the twin apertures for the jumping minute and tens of minutes. So it's a quirky dial that perhaps has a little bit more of a calculated chaos to it than the Teutonic order of the Zeitwerk. Now you turn it over and it's got a lot going for it. And this is where we're gonna get close again, get everything back in focus move closer and give ourselves some more aperture. The Jorn movement is a work of fine art. It's not quite as grandly finished as the Zeitwerk, but the fact that it's crafted entirely in 18 karat rose gold is something special. It's also considerably less complex than the Zeitwerk with just over 230, 234 pieces compared to the 415 in the Zeitwerk and 31 pivot jewels compared to the Zeitwerk's 68. Now, it's not adjusted, at least it hasn't been declared adjusted in any number of positions, so I'm going to say that the Zeitwerk probably takes accuracy being adjusted in five positions and blessed with an overcoil and a remontoir. This is a far flatter watch, though, and that comes by virtue of the thinness of this caliber. You will note that it is reference 1509, whereas the Langa is caliber L043, each movement actually betrays the amount of time involved in designing it, because this watch came out in 2010, and the last two digits of a Jorn movement let you know the year that work started on the movement, whereas the first two digits of a longer caliber, L043, 04 was the year work began on the 2009 Zeitwerks caliber. Now, what Jorn has delivered is beautiful, as you can see, linear Cote de Genève across the bridges. The anglage on this movement is more industrially laid down. Some of the bevels are sharp and sheer and show milling marks, so it's not quite as beautifully finished as the Longa, but it is handsome. There's a perlage pattern across the base plate, and you can see the balance of this one is free sprung like the Longa, but it has a higher beat rate. Rather than 18,000, this one is 21.6. This watch does not feature stop seconds like the Longa, so you cannot quite set it precisely. Now, the timepiece is easier to wear, so if you have that small wrist, there's no bothering with a comparison. This is the watch for you. That said, if you can wear the Zeitwerk, it has its advantages. Let's start with the advantages of the Jorn since it's under the gun right now. Okay, first advantage, compact fit, tidier, more wrists will be able to wear this watch. There's the designer factor. For some folks, and Let's face it, anyone who recognizes either of these watches will recognize both. The FP Journe name carries a little bit more of a snob factor these days among cognoscenti of high-end watches. The Journe is much thinner and will easily wear under any cuff, and it comes with a full deployant clasp, which I think is really the only acceptable solution for a watch at this price point. Frankly, as soon as you're spending a grand, you should get a deployant of some description. I would also say rarity. With 69 of these made, you're not going to see too many, and rarely more than one in any single place, even among collectors. And finally, I think it's worth mentioning that although the timepiece does not have the same degree of caliber finish, there's something exquisite about executing an entire movement in precious metal, 18 karat two, not the harder and generally easier to finish 14 karat. So the entirety of the watch, though more compact than the Zeitwerk, feels almost as hefty and substantial on the wrist. Now, I will say this, the Zeitwerk has a number of advantages of its own, bringing the big bruiser from Glossuta back, you can see that this is a more natural watch to read. The V2 uses a pocket watch style jump hour and jump minute display, almost like what you'd find on an old IWC Josef Paul Weber system. You read it from top to bottom, and it's just not as natural as reading a watch from left to right. You'll also note that it's far more legible. On the Zeitwerk, there's no mistaking what time it is. You can read it at a glance. Contrast is high. Some folks are sticklers for symmetry, and on that measure, the Longa will impress, as it is a far more symmetrical dial, even if small details vary than what you'll find on the FP Journe. The movement, a work of art, but there's a lot more going into it than you find on the Journe. Yes, the Journe is gold, but in terms of engineering, the remontoir, the stop works, it's sensational. There's a reason why this timepiece features more than twice as many jewels and well over a hundred more parts. It's simply that much more complex and that much more rich. The engineering is more involved, and yes, the finishing is far more sophisticated, far finer, far more detailed. There's simply more to see and more to love here. 
In terms of power reserve, believe it or not, with a 36-hour power reserve, the Zeitwerk is the winner here, as the Vagabondage 2 is rated at 28 hours, plus or minus 2. So we're just going to call it 28 hours versus 36. Be prepared to wind them both each day. That said, the Langa is also the more pleasing and pleasurable watch to wind, and when it comes time to set the time, the Langa is the only one of the two that features hacking or stop seconds. It's simply more, more to see, more to finish, and in my opinion, more to love. If I have to editorialize, make mine the Langa. See them both and decide for yourself on our website and comment below the video. Let me know which one you would choose for your lonesome.